Okay, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, we, we're just going to talk through um, uh, something that myself and Wendy have come, come up with recently, and it's called Soul Films. And we want to talk to you about how it all came about and, um, and you know, let you know some of the process and, um, and then give you the opportunity to ask us questions as well about um, anything. Do you want to add to that, Wendy? Yeah, and uh, we're also going to finish the session. We're going to show one of the films, the first film that, that Sybil and I have made together under the project of, of Soul Films. So we'll finish the session and it's it's about 10, is it 10 minutes long, Sybil? Or it's not quite that long, is it? It's actually, yeah. yeah. And Very if you want to kind of join in the dialogue with us as we're chatting, please just ask questions as we're going along. Great. So Sybil's going to actually talk a little bit about the sort of her inspiration and her um, inspiration for sort of how we've kind of got to the point with Soul Films. So she's going to just introduce sort of her sort of thinking um, behind sort of the project as we know now as Soul Films. Over to you, Sybil. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think I think it really the whole. I've always wanted to do um, something around legacy or around memorials or around making films about people who who have have died. Um, and I think the the reason why I've always wanted to do this is because in 2002, my nephew died uh, very suddenly um, and very quite tragic, uh, quite tragically, well, very quickly, and he was only 19. And um, he lived in Australia and I had never, in fact, I'd never met him before. Um, he was actually, it was quite strange. He was the first person that I ever messaged on the internet. Um, it was a while back when he died, 2002. So I'd never messaged anyone before apart from him, but I never actually physically, I might have spoken to him, but I never saw him, met him. And so um, obviously my sister was very distraught. And um, when he he should have turned 20, which was September after he had died, he died in February, um, I went to New Zealand to, to sort of help her um, go through his 20th birthday. And, um, and then when I went there, I went there for three weeks. It was... Um, I'm really glad I went, but it was obviously very hard. Um, and although I'd never met Gavin, I felt quite connected to him and quite bereaved. It was quite a strange thing. I suppose I was feeling the bereavement of my own sister, or of, from my sister. Um, and so when I went to Australia, we talked, obviously talked a lot about Gavin. And, um, and then we decided that um, she could give me all her, the photos that she had of Gavin um she would give them to me physically because this was 2002 i don't know if there was digital photography then i don't think there was anyway i bought all the pictures home physically and there was like lots and lots of um of photographs and um and then i bought it home and then I, I edited i edited the uh clips together i just photographed them and edited them and i made a 20 minute film and um, she came over at Christmas and then um, I showed it to her then. And then she was able to physically take the photographs back. Um, and I just felt the process was really, really good. I felt that um, it felt quite healing to see all these photos of Gavin alive and laughing. In fact, actually, all his pictures was of him laughing. And I really felt I got to a sense of who he was. And... Um, and so um, I, I spoke to my sister and she felt that it was really useful to have that film. And since then, I've always wanted to, to do, a, you know, to approach funeral companies. And I'm a filmmaker, both myself and Wendy are filmmakers. And um, I wanted to approach funeral uh, directors, but I just never, never got round to it. And it was only in 2000 and it was last year 2020 that the idea came back um again um and that was when 
a, a very close friend of ours, both myself and Wendy's, a, a friend died um, quite suddenly and tragically as well. And um, and then later on, another very, very close friend of Wendy's and, and mine as well died in August. And and we got together and um, and thought about that and um, thought, wouldn't it be good to to make a film about those two people? And we started thinking about making a film about them and the space that would be where we'd have the films. And um, our friend Julia, she worked in a recording studios and they were making a memorial garden for her. So it felt like a right place to to have something like that. Um, and then Anne, um, Wendy um, had, had organized for a tree to be planted. So it felt right that Anne's, um, Anne's film could be there as well. Um, do you want to continue from that, Wendy? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. I'll, just, I'll, I'll just add that, that uh, the unique, unique concept that Sybil came up with was to have a QR code that would connect to the film. So the sort of the idea is that uh, we would make a film about the person um, who's died and then there would be a QR code at a place of significance to that person so then people can actually just zap the QR code and then go straight to see the film about them online um, and I think also during the pandemic people are using QR codes much more now so we actually felt that the time was right to actually use this technology as a way to Almost, we also talked, Sybil, didn't we, about sort of blue plaques and, you know, how there's plaques on places yeah. of where important yeah. people, places, uh, people of significance lived. It's almost kind of playing on that concept as well of it, it was creating, yeah. Yeah. creating um, sort of a link to the person and their relationship to the space where the QR code will be. So as Sybil said, the QR code is going to be a memorial garden in the studios where Julia worked. And then Anne, our other friend who died later on last year, there will be a QR code on her tree that's in Hackney. So, you know, then anybody who's passing and is interested and wants to engage can um, can learn more about her. So it's about creating a legacy for, for, for people. Um, yeah. So I think from, from that, we've actually thought this could possibly be a concept that we can um, we can we can offer as a service to people. Yeah, and um, during the pandemic, um, I'd I'd also been working on a on a project with um, Joe Douglas, who's one of the or co-organizer with you, Victoria, um, and we'd we'd worked with Kate Hargreaves and we'd we'd also um, talked about the idea of um, of blue plaques and QR codes as well. So I suppose that the whole QR code idea in the pandemic had come about because that's what people were, you know, QR codes are so accessible to to everyone. Apparently you can have any smartphone and it will be able to read a QR code. Um, and it, it, I just felt that it was quite a nice concept of um, if, for example, people are, have got park benches um, and and I'm always very curious actually about that person when I read um, on a park bench about, you just get a little snippet of, of their, their name and the date of their birth and the date of their death. You don't really get to see much more. And I'm always quite curious about people when I see the um, their names on a park bench and um, and obviously that's a significant place where people have chosen to have that park bench so the idea is that you you could sit down um, um, put your phone next to the QR code and then watch a short film about that person um, but one of the things, though, that I thought about, that we thought about quite a bit was that because um, I wanted to do a film also for my mum. My mum recently died last year as well. And I, I played around with that idea 
and um, found that quite difficult to think about in a way, more so. Um, but I suddenly, I sort of realized that what was difficult was that um, if you have one person giving someone's story, like myself for my mum, um, it was quite hard to make a short film to work out what are all the things about that person that's important in a short film. Um, and then I, I, I thought, actually, I'd prefer it if there wasn't one author in these films. I'd prefer it if there were more people talking. Um, and that's why we thought of the, both myself and Wendy thought of the idea of inviting friends um, to talk about to talk about the person who has died. So, for example, with Julia, we um, had a day at the premises recording studio, which is where Julia worked, and we had people who were friends and colleagues from from that um, from the recording studio come and talk and share their stories about Julia and talk about her. Um, and we just found that, I've, and we did the same process for Anne, our friend Anne, except this time it wasn't in the recording studio, it was in a pub that she she loved and loved her actually. Um, and we just had a day in a pub and a, a booth behind the bar and people just came and talked and we, we, we spoke to a lot of people, a lot of Anne's friends, and we we sort of discovered in a way, didn't we, that um, it was actually quite a therapeutic process where you you come together and you talk about that person. Um, I think especially with Anne, um, Wendy had organised a whole day around the, um, the talking, so she'd organised a walk um, and um, the tree planting, so, so, so it was a whole day around thinking about Anne and one of those things that you could do was go to on talk on camera about about Anne and um and yeah we we've made the the first film which is Julia's film and we're now in the process of editing Anne's um and and it's been a really lovely process actually hasn't it, it it's it, it, and there is something in there about it being something of a healing process and there's possibly some some re one of the reasons why we are doing it is to to be able to talk about our friends in a way that isn't just about sadness or about loss um and we've I, I'm very aware that by doing a project like this and um, having the platform to talk about our friends who we have lost and missed, miss very much, um, it's creating a healing sort of process at the same time. Yeah, it was really lovely actually, I think after the, um, the filming day, the day, um, that we had for Anne and we actually kind of coordinated the day around the anniversary, the one year anniversary of her death. Um, you know, I think people really appreciated coming together a year later. As, as Sybil said, we did a walk and then at, the walk ended at the pub where the filming was happening. And then everybody had an opportunity to sit down for 10 minutes, uh, talk to camera um, about Anne and then, you know, people who just stood around the bar having a drink, continuing to talk about Anne. So it was just a lovely opportunity to commemorate her and to keep keep her memory alive in the process. And the film, you know, will be sort of a lasting legacy of that because it will live on in the form of the film and can be accessed at the site of the tree, uh, which was also planted on that day. So. I think we're realising that the filming process and the creating of the film, you know, could be part of um, memorialisation that can happen sort of after sort of a traditional funeral. It could be a time where people come together. It's an event um, and it will have significance for people and it could be cathartic and part of the bereavement process. Yeah. and and and. Even for those people who don't know that person, I think it's it's of interest as well. Um, because like I said, you know, in those benches, I'm always really, really curious actually about about who who those people are. And sometimes you just hear you just see a quote from them or or something like that. It makes you even more curious. Um, 
and I think people are interested in um, in people really in stories and um, and and it's quite nice to have that time to to sit and and actually think about that person. Um, I think in particular as well with with these two friends of uh, Sybil and I who, who died last year, neither of them had children. Um, and it, for me, um, Anne, she, she was also single, had no children and had limited family. So for me, it feels really important to, to create legacy for her as a, you know, she's an old school um, school friend. I've known her since I was 11 years old. And I just feel it's so important to create legacy for her because she has limited family that are going to do that for her. Um, and she was an amazing woman and she deserves to be honoured and, and remembered. And she she was a big part of her community in Hackney. She was a lawyer. Um, you know, she helped many people. She was a family lawyer and she was she was known in, in that area. Um, so it just kind of warms my heart just to know that, you know, we're creating content to help remember her as a woman. It's the same thing for Julia as well she also had limited family yeah um, so the legacy feels even more important because the memories will get lost otherwise and i think um you'd mentioned also um wendy about how um if friends organize a funeral it's very different actually to if uh, um a family if it's if it's an, a family event um because you'd mentioned that there was a friend that you had in brighton who um, whose whose memorial was organised by friends, and it had a very different feel, didn't it? Yeah, it did. I, don't, I suppose it depends what your relationship is with your family, but and how close you are to your family. But I suspect that friends are in quite a strong position. I think in terms of organising funerals and memorials to um, sort of honour that person if that person hasn't requested, like both of. In, in our in Sybil and my cases, you know, both our friends died very, very suddenly, young. They were both in their early fifties, um, so there hadn't really been any conversation about end of life with with any, with either of them. So, I I just felt as a friend, I just had a sense. I knew knew what she would wanted. I just knew what she wanted, and her her mother who. Um, is still living. Her sister is in Australia. You know, her mother was maybe quite traditional in in her approach to funerals, but she was open because she couldn't really get involved with the process because of the distance, because of the pandemic and her own health issues. So I was really appreciative that she was open to sort of hearing my suggestions of alternative ways of going about the funeral. And I actually uh, did the um, Living Well, Dying Well uh, doula foundation course, which uh, about three years ago. So that had really given me the confidence and the insight into knowing how to do funerals differently. So I just actually just went went for it with, with Anne's funeral and kind of gave myself time and space to create um, I suppose you would call it more of a, a memorial or a, a celebration um, of her rather than what you would know as a traditional. I, I don't know. I don't know how you would how you would actually term it, really. But it was a funeral, but perhaps it was more in the tradition of being um, a life celebration, a commemoration of her. And we actually did it in a hall, so we had the whole afternoon to come together. Um, because we weren't in a traditional space like a crematorium, I could actually, and it was, you know, because of COVID, there was limitations with numbers. There was a bit of flexibility because certain people could be staff members. So I think we actually had about 40 people there in the end. And we had the whole afternoon to come together and her body was brought to this hall. And we just took control of, of, how we wanted to celebrate her and remember her without sort of time limitations. And it was a really beautiful Wonderful. afternoon. Um, so that 
has just kind of carried on, I think, with these the idea for the films and some other ideas that we're having. Because she was a lawyer, we're also setting up uh, an initiative, a charity, sort of in her name, to help victims of domestic violence with legal support. And, um, yeah, it, it actually just feels really nurturing to just be doing these various things, including the films, and that she's the inspiration for a project that both of her and I feel could grow and we could offer to other people as part of their bereavement process, as a legacy to their loved ones who have died. Yeah, and it, it does feel good to to do it, doesn't it? It feels like we're um, we're closer to to them as a result. Helen's actually asked, who owns the films, and how do you gain consent? Um, well, actually, I I I think it's the person who commissions us actually who should own the film um, because but we haven't had a formal conversation about that, Wendy. Actually, no, but I yeah, um, I don't have any attachment to needing to to own own the film personally. I, as Sybil said, we haven't actually had a. It's a good question. We actually haven't had that. <laughs> <laughs> that conversation but I, I think the people who commission the film should it, it's their film we are making it for them yeah that's what I'd say completely because I feel we're being if we if you know we're literally being commissioned to to make a film so you know we wouldn't be there unless the person had given us the the right to be there so for me um I wouldn't want to hold copyright. Yeah, and I think, Helen, when you see the film that we're going to show, um, I think you'll realise that we we gain consent because everybody who's in the film is consenting to be there and be interviewed and to be part of the film. Um, so it's a very sort of collaborative process with um, the people who want to be part of the film and to talk about the person who has passed yeah yeah and um yeah most people will be consenting as they as they're being filmed um yeah if you it, does that answer your question um helen it's great to have a three-way four-way conversation we might as well make the most of this so um if you're still there um does that answer your your question thank you that that makes sense okay. thank you helen Oh, feel free to ask other questions actually whenever you want because this is quite nice it's quite nice to get that interaction so if there's anything else that comes to mind please do because it's quite nice for us to think about it in that way actually Wendy isn't it because yeah. copyright isn't something um that we considered but for me generally I, I never keep copyright when I'm being commissioned to do something anyway um Shall I show Julia's film now? Do you think this could be a good time to do that? She, yeah. uh, whilst I'm doing that, um, Wendy, do you want to um, give it a little bit of an introduction? Because it will take me a couple of minutes to get sure. to that. So Sib Sybil actually has her own production company called Flexible Films, and she is very generously offered uh, her and her partner own this company together. So, um, you know, they have made, they've made films for Death Cafe and they make films for lots of other charities and organisations. So um, we're kind of using their equipment and their facilities to, to make the films. So they have a booth that they can set up for interviews. So as Sybil mentioned earlier, we actually set up one of their booths at the premises recording studios in Hackney which was the recording studios that Julia actually managed for, I don't know, a long time, like over 20 years, I think, she was working there. So she was quite a figurehead for that business and made a huge impact um, on the development of the business, as you will find out in the film. So we kind of kept the focus of the film very much centred around the premises recording studios. So we interviewed people that had a relationship with the studios, who worked at the studios, um, her colleague and um, the owner of the studios also speaks in the film. Um, and that's sort of the idea of what, what, we, what we want to keep integral to these films is that the space 
um, of where the QR code will be, the access to viewing the film will be part of the focus of the film. So with our other friend, you know, it, we're kind of making Hackney sort of the focus of her film. So, um, you know, it can be sort of job, um, where you live, place of interest, somewhere, you know, where, where you spend a lot of time can be the focus and where the QR code will be. So, um, yeah, so that that's what we focused on with Julia's film was her career, her relationship with the premises, uh, the impact that she had on the premises as, as a business. And um, yeah. Yeah, great. Well, I can share the video, but I've just seen Helen. Your point, which is, it's very odd that you can't see me when you're at the end. It's very true. I think what what we could do, um, if Victoria's still still there, um, after we've shared the video, um, in I think Victoria can make you appear, Helen. It'd be really yeah. nice to see you. It would be lovely to see you, Helen. So, is that if 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 it's okay? Shall we show the the video first, and then yes. after that, we'll get to see you. That would be lovely. I think that was one of the defining features of Julia actually was her intellectual curiosity and um, questioning of anything from architecture to philosophy to politics. She amazed me actually because she was really quite good at um, organising and you know having lots of lots of spinning lots of different plates at the same time. She was kind of multifaceted as a person. Yeah, had a lot of heart. I mean Julia was a wonderful tour de force and she stormed into all of our lives. And she did the same to the premises. She tore into it and made it something really exciting alongside everyone else. Julia gave it real shape and she gave it such vitality and energy and different directions. I bought the business out of bankruptcy and uh, so I was plunged into this at very short notice. Louise, I think, was the uh, managing director at that point. She recommended Julia, and I met her. Um, I don't think there was even a like an interview. You know, we just sat down and chatted. And I thought, yeah, you'll do. Yeah. Um, so Julia took over and just found her own way into the into the job of being, you know, effectively my right hand person and. Uh, we got to grips with the whole uh, chaos, really, of the studios and rebuilt them up pretty much from scratch. And we worked as a great team of two um, running the show between us. She had an interest in environmental issues. I did too, not to the same extent, um, but I think it kind of started to come together when we built the recording studio here on the site we're in at the moment. And the obvious thing to do was to make it the first solar powered recording studio in Europe. Because we built the studio from scratch, we were able to use all the recycled materials in building it. So the whole studio has a carbon neutral footprint. There was an invitation to go and represent the premises to talk about the solar powered recording studio at a huge convention in, in Brazil. So that was a huge trip for her and she loved doing that. Uh, and I think she was in her element there. We formed the charity as a kind of sister charity to uh, the Premises Music Education Program in 1996. And we ran kind of music courses and also activities really for local young people. Over the years, I mean, some of the things that she came up with, I just thought were fabulous. But the one I enjoyed working on alongside her the most was called Voice Jams. And that was a summer program and half terms for young 
kids who wanted to be involved with a sort of a, a choir, and, and it was quite a modern thing as well, like almost like a modern urban choir. Julia pioneered lots of the innovations in this place, and, and one of them was her idea for a project that was part social, part ecological, which was to have beehives on the roof of the premises. I think everyone's initial reaction was, oh my God, the studio is going to be full of bees or something, but you know, they would never, they're on the roof, they never come down, they just fly off to the gardens around it. We often took people up to see the hive. Madness are mostly local lads. They were very supportive. They thought it was a great idea. I set up a, a CCTV camera to monitor what the bees were doing, whether they were seemed happy. I don't know how you do that really, but yeah, bees are doing their, their bee thing. Julia was the sort of person who treated everyone pretty much the same and by that I mean she treated them as if they were all very special. So and people do remember her, you know, in that way. I mean, someone from a band in yesterday, a band called Simon Mandy, who have uh, been coming here for years and years, they specifically said, oh, we so miss Julia, you know, uh, we remember her, she was always so friendly and outgoing, always looked after us, made sure everything was right, and uh, she had great attention to detail. Julia wasn't phased really by anything. Whatever it was needed doing, she would do that. And uh, yeah, we kind of miss all that. And that was the last time I saw her was at the at a premises party actually and you know that's how I kind of remember her you know the kind of reasonably understated queen of the proceedings. It's been an amazing sort of 15-20 years of seeing you know you come and look at the board of who's in and you're like wow that didn't used to happen those bands used to rehearse in Terminal and other places and then you know here they are, they're all here now and have been for you know many years. And that's, that's down to the organisation, which Julia was a key part of. The fact that she's been here for 23 years is quite amazing. I think it became her family, actually. I kind of still feel like she's here in some, some way, yeah. Julia wasn't somebody for, for being front and centre. She liked to be involved in, in making things happen. But when it came to the big photo at the end of everyone involved, she'd be sort of keeping to the side a little bit, being very modest about her input. But um, her input would always be, you know, phenomenal, really. She's a little bird that sings. She's the butterfly that flaps its special pretty fairy wings. She's a fish without a swim bladder. A splish without a splash She's my love, she's my heart, she's my one She's a folded paper bow Bobbing on the bobbing sea She's all the flowers in the garden And I'm the bumblebee She's a bounce inside the bunny She's the cherry on the tree Yeah, great. Oh, we can have Helen now, can't we? <laughs> It was quite a nice process to actually, like we were saying, to actually do that film, wasn't it, Wendy? To, um, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> so we feel like we're birthing a project um, and we're, we're ready. We're sort of ready to start offering the films to people. Um, the, these two films that we've been making for our friends have been great research. So, yeah, we want the process to be very much part of of the making it and, you know, part of people's bereavement process, commemoration, memorial. Um, and I think both Sybil and I are both, both feel that we can hold that space for people as well. And it's just as much a part of, of um, the process is just as important as making actual film. So yes, watch watch this space. Martine, whilst we're waiting for Helen to come yeah. back, Martina has said what a magnificent way to create legacy. Thank you. Oh thank thank you, Martina. 
Thank the you encouragement. For, well, to be honest, I think it, I think it's been a really good process for myself and Wendy because we are actually grieving. You know, we are we are like it is a bit of a process of grief. It feels like a therapeutic process for us, um, but I'm pretty sure that um, it, it's a therapeutic process to talk about people who have died anyway. So it's been a therapeutic process for us but it's also been a very therapeutic process for our friends who've spoken to us about our friends um our friends so i think it's therapeutic all round really because i think also the product becomes something that the film becomes something that's really quite meaningful to fam to the family and friends and and meaningful to the space as well um but helen now that you've got a voice i'd love to hear it <laughs> You want to hear my voice now? <laughs> no, I've been really interested. I, um, I'm a nurse by background, really interested in arts and health, um, all sorts of medium, but I currently, I lead the day hospice in our local hospice. Um, and we do recorded life stories, um, but we currently do that with the patients. Um, we've had to do it virtually, obviously, but this kind of feels like an almost another step. And I, yeah, I completely, I think it's so it's not just the product but it's the process isn't it that's really therapeutic for everybody that's involved yeah i i completely agree i think it, it's got mm -hmm. the process has got to be almost as important to me as i think as, so. as the the product um yeah and it's also possible to do this about people who are reaching the end of their life too so mm. it, could be, it could be that that person is is held in that process too whilst and wouldn't it be lovely if you know um they actually hear other people talking about them and you know how affirming could that be at the end of your life when because you never i always think that don't you that you know a funeral people say the nicest things about you but often you're not there to hear it <laughs> no it's amazing isn't it how lovely to be able to hear those things mm -hmm. um yeah no definitely yeah so helen do you think do you think there would be interest in in what we're offering I think so, definitely. I mean, we've looked at developing, a, a, we've had to change the way that we do things because of COVID. So our, our day hospice is very different. Um, I think it'll be virtual for quite a long time, but there's a definite appetite, I think, for, for people to kind of leave some kind of legacy. And I have seen that more over the last 18 months that patients are asking me much more about, yeah, about future planning and about the things that they can kind of um, leave for their families um, and I've definitely seen that increase through through lockdown for sure mm. yeah I, I wonder if it's because people have been separated from their families they've not seen their families for a long while um, and so actually you know because they're nearing end of life they've wanted to really leave something behind so we've been as I say we do the recorded life stories um, we do memory boxes, but the films, I think also as we get, you know, we do get quite young patients sometimes. And so they're looking at a different sort of medium perhaps than we've looked at before. Um, but having said that, I've, you know, I've got a 90 year old that, that comes on our virtual social drop in every week. So I think everyone's getting used to this sort of technology, but, and I love the idea of the QR codes. I think it keeps it simple in a way, doesn't it? It does. And I, and I wonder, you know, even because people will often come back to the hospice where that person has died and we've got a beautiful garden and how lovely that, you know, perhaps we could put some QR codes mm. around the garden so that the families could come back, watch the films, but also be in that space that they find really therapeutic. Yeah, yeah. And I think film gives you a bit of a focus as well. So, um, you know and, and you can watch films a few times actually and different yeah see different things and it's just a bit of a conversation starter as well isn't it, it yeah definitely it means that and it could it could also be helen you know what you're currently doing you know in, in the hospices it's like you're creating you're you're capturing content and then as you said the next step could be then to sort of bring you know a project in like sibling mind to then sort of develop that content yeah, and I think, you know, we're looking at ways that we can support patients and families um, 
in ways that they find really helpful. And I think, you know, some of the traditional ways, I've been in palliative care a long time, and some of the traditional ways that we've done things, particularly in day hospice, is changing. Yeah. Um, so it feels quite exciting. It feels like there are lots of opportunities to support people in different ways. But I think, you know, the, the, the making of memories and the leaving of legacies is just so important. I mean, from a personal perspective, my mum died five years ago with MND, and the thing, you know, I miss her in many, many ways, but I miss her voice. Um, and we were lucky enough that she did do some filming for a company that she used to work for, so I regularly go back onto the website to, to listen to that interview. Um, but that, you know, you know we're actually now, because of the era we're living in, everything's digitised, you know, people yeah. are dying and it's, nobody's got family albums anymore, uh, particularly no. with younger generations, you know, and yeah. very easily a lot of that imagery can, can be lost, um, you know, so it's, it's an opportunity to bring some of those visual memories together and put them in one place, you know, for, in the yeah. film. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I had ideas uh, a while ago about creating books as well um, mm. with people before they died at uh, yeah. end of life. Yeah, I think it's it's um it's very meaningful for people. I mean, they really enjoy the the memory boxes, especially yeah. some of the younger patients. I had a lady recently; she's very young, um, and she did memory boxes for all of the the children, and because she wanted to leave, you know, she wanted to leave something behind for them, and and there were cards for them to open at significant dates and and things like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's I think there's a huge opportunity for for films in all of this, definitely. Yeah. Do you like the idea, um, Helen, of, of the space, you know, um, like for example, like you say, in the hospice, people come back to that space because it's meaningful to them. Um, yeah. do, do you like that as a concept? Because I thought, I, I, I think in a way, that's what, what I, I quite like about this project, that, that um, there is a space where you go to think about that person too. Yeah, I think so, because spaces are really meaningful to people, aren't they? And I guess as long as the space is accessible to people that want to access it. Um, but yeah, I think space is hugely um, important, very meaningful. And, and you say, you know, as you say, it gives you a reason to go back. So I think sometimes when people are bereaved, it's very hard for them to go back to, to a certain place. But if they've got a reason to go back, it just makes it, it just makes it a little bit easier, I think. I think also with this project, it kind of comforts me to know that people are still going to continue to learn about the person, you know, as, you know Julia yeah. and Anne, yeah. you know, after that, you know, even if they didn't know them, yeah. it's, um, you know, Julia had such a significance in the development of that recording studio yeah. and so many different people go through that, through there on a daily basis and it might just be that an artist might be there having their lunch, you never met her and you know, might yeah. just be touched hearing the story and that, I, I like, I just like to know that, that that person think, is living on in some sort of way stories, through, through their film. Yeah, I think all our stories are quite inspiring, aren't they, in, in yeah. many, many ways. I love people's stories. And also I think, you know, perhaps leaving legacies for future generations. My, um, I didn't make it too personal, but my mum died literally just before my first granddaughter was born. So she knew that she, yeah. my daughter was expecting and she heard the heartbeat, but she never met her. So I want to do something for my granddaughter and, and now my grandson um, to remember her by, really. And so, that, you know, that's something that I'm doing. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a legacy for future generations, isn't it, as well? Exactly. And how, how yeah. lovely to see that. Yeah, and they can really I think it's great. It's amazing work. Thank you very much. They, I think they can really um, get to know people through film as mm. well, can't they? Um, yeah. But I'm aware it's now um, uh, past nine, uh, past, yeah, past <laughs> nine, is it? <laughs> Lost time, really. It's 9.03. 9.03. Oh, it's, oh, it's been lovely. Thank you for allowing me to Oh, Helen, thanks on. for turning up in this yeah, weird virtual space. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it just wasn't us talking to each other. So it was really nice. Yeah, to have no, it's been done. great. It's and been thank great. You and the whole festival is well. um, the whole festival so far. It's good. I've got oh, my second yeah. book for tomorrow. Enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. And, thank you so um, much for coming. We'll put actually we've got a Facebook page at the moment. So yeah. Yeah. if you're on Facebook you can you can if you search for Soul Films. 
Okay. You'll find Brilliant. our page. It'd be great if you could follow us and then we can keep you up to date mm, with, we'll keep you in with what we're doing. That'd be amazing. I'll actually Thank put you. it in the chat now. And enjoy the rest of the festival as well, Helen. There's loads on, isn't there? So there is, yeah. Almost almost too much difficult to know what to do. I know. Pick, but, um, <laughs> amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Helen. Well, take care then. And bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>